the News 4 Rundown is sponsored by FH Fur. More major rulings today as the U.S. Supreme Court wraps up another controversial term. The decisions made this week and the impact on you. Plus, a Maryland law going into effect this weekend clears the way for recreational use of marijuana for some. What you need to know before visiting a dispensary. And with youth crime on the rise in the district, a business owner from Northeast is offering up a safe space for teens this summer. You're watching the News 4 Rundown. A lot of news from all over the place today. And thanks for joining us for the News 4 Rundown, our newscast streaming for you. I'm Tommy McFly. And I'm Leon Harris. It is Friday, June 30th, and we're going to begin with a look at some of the top stories we're following. A man involved in the January 6th riot was in federal court this afternoon after being arrested yesterday near the Calorama home of former President Barack Obama. Taylor Taranto was ordered to be held without bond. The government says that they found two guns, a machete, and ammunition inside his car yesterday. NBC News reports a review of Toronto's Telegram account shows that his last posting was a link to a website touting conspiracy theories about the Obama's home. A man has been arrested in connection to vandalism of a Pride art installation in Hyattsville. Police say 29-year-old Kenny Guevara of Chillum spray-painted over a recently completed quilted crossing art installation commissioned by the city. Officers say they saw Guevara flee the scene on Thursday afternoon and then return that night around 10 o'clock to continue spray-painting the area. He faces charges of destruction of property and a hate crime. Oscar-winning actor Alan Arkin has died. His sons confirmed their father's death, saying Arkin was, quote, a uniquely talented force of nature, both as an artist and a man. Earlier in his career, he was part of the famed Second City comedy troupe. Arkin received four Academy Award nominations, winning in 2006 for his supporting actor role in Little Miss Sunshine. After more than 40 years separated his first nomination, he finally won an Oscar. Arkin was 89 years old. Now we turn to another landmark day in American justice. The Supreme Court just ended its session with two historic decisions that have broad reach. The conservative supermajority overruled President Biden's plan to relieve 43 million Americans of a big chunk of their student loan debt. But he says he's not giving up. And conservatives sided with a web designer in a decision that critics say is an alarming setback for LGBTQ rights. The NBC's... In another day of major shakeups, the Supreme Court's conservative majority blocking President Biden's student loans forgiveness plan, ruling six to three that the president had gone too far without congressional approval in moving to cancel more than $400 billion in student loan debt. You borrow some money to go to college and uh, there, there should be responsibility to pay that back. That's going to crush us financially. President Biden already working on alternatives to deliver on a campaign promise. To provide student debt relief to as many borrowers as possible, as quickly as possible. That's why we're creating a temporary 12-month, what we're calling on-ramp repayment program. The administration had argued it was legal to let some 43 million eligible borrowers cancel up to $20,000 in debt under a statute regarding national emergencies like the COVID pandemic. But the court decided the plan overstepped the president's authority. In a separate significant case today, the high court ruled in favor of a Colorado web designer who wanted to be able to reject same-sex wedding clients. And I'm grateful for the court for affirming that the government can't force anyone to say something they don't believe. The court's majority decided that as a creative professional, Lori Smith's First Amendment rights shielded her from punishment under Colorado's anti-discrimination law because, quote, Colorado seeks to force an individual to speak in ways that align with its views but defy her conscience about a matter of major significance. The dissenting liberal justices argued the First Amendment does not protect the act of discrimination, noting this is the the first time the high court has granted a business open to the public a constitutional right to refuse to serve members of a protected class and saying that will quote mark gays and lesbians for second class status. 
after a series of major rulings that in many cases overturned decades of precedent. A number of progressive lawmakers are now calling for a variety of Supreme Court reforms. Though President Biden made clear again yesterday he does not support expanding the court, arguing that would only further politicize the process. In Washington, Alice Barr, NBC News. Now, those new actions on student debt that the president mentioned today include a new repayment program where, for a year, borrowers who miss their payments will not be subject to penalties or be reported to credit agencies. He also announced a change to the administration's income-based repayment plan. Previously, a borrower, borrower rather, could be required to pay up to 10 percent of their disposable income. That's now being reduced to 5 percent. Today's Supreme Court decision to strike down President Biden's student loan forgiveness program highlights a critical problem facing American students. Now, college some affordability. I'm sorry, Leon. Now, mm. some education advocates are pushing federal leaders to do more to help students who need it the most. Investigative reporter Ted Oberg joins us. We're talking about the Pell Grant, the largest subsidy the U.S. government has provided for decades to help low-income students achieve the college dream. But education advocates tell the I-Team, as the cost of college has soared, the Pell Grant just hasn't kept up. About a third of all American college students receive a Pell Grant, nearly 315,000 alone in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. The idea behind creating the Pell Grant in the 70s was simple. By helping the nation's poorest college students, the nation was helping itself. Higher education has the best chance of putting you on a career trajectory that breaks cycles of poverty. Kyle Southern studies these issues at the Institute for College Access and Success, where he's tracked how college inflation has outpaced the power of the Pell Grant. At its height, that program would cover about 80 percent of the cost of going to college. Now it's almost a quarter, certainly less than a third. The most a student can receive in the upcoming school year is about $7,400, $500 more than it was last year. Not bad until you consider the average cost of college is about $35,000 a year, according to the Education Data Initiative, twice what it was two decades ago. That's why Kyle is among those pushing for Congress to increase the aid to more than $13,000 per Pell Grant. That'd be a huge increase. Yes. But... It's hard to find a better return on investment than the Pell Grant. The effort has gained some steam on the Hill, where lawmakers like Virginia Senator Tim Kaine have supported efforts to increase the aid. Kaine also wants the Pell Grant to be extended to students enrolling in job training programs. We're not only hurting, you know, individuals and families by they can't get access to skills or they ended up with too much debt when they get out. What we're really doing is putting ankle weights around the American economy as we're trying to outcompete nations around the world. It is a much discussed goal in Congress, but does not appear close this summer as the Supreme Court issues decisions affecting millions of current and future college students. In the meantime, Southern says the need for change is great as disparities widen. Well, the average white borrower is looking at a bill when they come out of college about $28,000. The average black borrower is coming out about $50,000. And so you see how the disparity in family wealth translate into increased debt burdens that put people even farther behind when they're starting in their careers. While a national group of college financial aid administrators has suggested increasing the Pell Grant as a long-term sustainable solution to help low-income students achieve college access, a group of conservatives in Congress have suggested it would only increase the cost of tuition for everyone. I'm Ted Ober for the News 4 IT. And remember, we're working for you both on air and online as we learn more about the fallout from both of these historic decisions. You can always count on us to find expert analysis on our website and right here on the NBC Washington app. And heads up to Virginia drivers. The state's new move over law changes on Saturday and first force traffics. Melissa Malay is here with what you need to know. The new law requires drivers to move over for any vehicle on the side of the road when they have flashers, flares, or any warning signs out. Now, before this change, drivers only had to move over for emergency vehicles, tow trucks, and VDOT workers. Between 2016 and 2020, 28 people were killed outside disabled vehicles in Virginia alone. If you have the availability or the capability to change lanes, one lane over, you're good. If not, slow down. But really, everybody in those environments should slow down, and that'll help everybody get home safely, including the, those that are on the side of the road doing their jobs. 
Now, if you're pulled over for violating the law, it'll be a $250 fine. Now, gas prices and another change. If you buy gas in Virginia, and so many of us do, the gas tax there is increasing by 7% Saturday, but it may not cost you more to fill up. That's because the tax is charged directly to gas companies and individual gas stations will have to decide if they'll pass that fee on to customers. Back to you. Thanks, Melissa. Now on the Maryland side, starting on Saturday, a new law will legalize cannabis for those 21 and over, as well as non-prescription sales. There are 26 dispensaries that are going to be opening up in some local Maryland counties starting tomorrow. And as you can see, the majority of them are in Montgomery County, a total of 14 dispensaries there. News 4's Jackie Benson explains how this program is going to work and what you need to know. Starting on July 1st, so on Saturday morning, will be open to recreational patients, so anyone over 21. Uh, Rise, which currently has four Maryland locations, Silver Spring, Bethesda, Hagerstown, and Joppa. What's been selling well? Is among the dispensaries getting ready for a seismic shift Saturday morning. You know, this is a really historic moment uh, for us, and we're, we're just really humbled to be a part of this. And we also have them in two different sizes. We have them in the 0.35 as well as the 0.75 gram. And from here, you have a lot of categories to pick from if you wanted to choose by these. Rise's website will begin taking over 21 use pre-orders at midnight Friday for cannabis sales within the newly legal amounts. For law enforcement, new laws often require educating both officers and the public. Last year, Montgomery County Police began training officers to spot weed impairment behind the wheel. This is the educational piece. that Police Chief Marcus Jones. Personal use is allowed. Um, you cannot smoke it anywhere, right? So you cannot smoke it in public. You cannot smoke it in a park. You can't smoke it in a car. Over here you have our edibles. Of note, you can only buy from a licensed dispensary and you cannot legally take your purchase out of Maryland, including by mail. Cannabis products are subject to a 9% state sales tax, the same as alcohol. Legalization could potentially bring hundreds of millions of dollars in annual tax revenue. This chain plans ribbon cutting ceremonies at all of its Maryland locations on Saturday morning. In Silver Spring, Jackie Benson, News 4. We'll have a complete guide of all the new laws going to affect this weekend on our website, so be sure and check out NBCWashington.com and be careful out there, folks. Absolutely. The district is updating its plans to accelerate getting rid of lead water pipes. D.C. Water released its lead-free D.C. plan today. Leaders have a goal of removing all lead water pipes and replacing them with copper by 2030. D.C. Water plans wanting residents to know that there are tools that you can find out if you have lead pipes and how to get rid of them potentially with a free replacement. The district says it will cost more than one and a half billion dollars to finish those replacement efforts. And still ahead, holiday safety in the district. How D.C. police are preparing for the 4th of July holiday and the crowds that come along with it. Plus this. Coming together for the right reasons. I'm Mauricio Casillas. Ahead on News 4, we'll introduce you to the DC nonprofit that's mentoring teens and providing them job opportunities this summer. Whether you need electrical, plumbing, or HVAC service, FH FIRST expert technicians have you covered. Now, during our Super Summer Comfort event, schedule any of FH FIRST award-winning services and score $75 off. That's an astonishing $75 off any electrical, plumbing, or HVAC service now only during FH FIRST Super Summer Comfort event. From flickering lights, pesky leaks, to keeping you cool during the sweltering summer heat, you know who to call. 877-GOFFER-FHFIRST.COM Taking a look now at Reagan National Airport, you know, the 4th of July travel rush is well underway already. And the TSA expects to see the, its highest volume of passengers in more than three years. And today, airlines are hoping to rebound after a rough week of air travel. Airports across the country filled with stranded passengers due to that nasty weather we've been getting and also staffing issues. TSA is expecting more than 2.8 million travelers today alone. And airports, they're going to be getting busier as we head into the holiday weekend. Well, it's been a bad experience so far. Um, I have a newborn right here, and I have to be waiting five hours. So it's really a bad experience. 
Those travel troubles have been especially rough on United Airlines. United says things are getting better and it expects fewer delays and cancellations into this weekend. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. Especially for all those travelers out there. Now there's a ton of things to enjoy. Fourth of July in the district and local officials are making sure you have fun and also you stay safe. There you go. News for us, Derek Ward has more on your Fourth of July safety. The National Mall is always the center of attention on the 4th, but if you plan to celebrate somewhere outside the federal enclave, there's some things D.C. wants you to know. A reminder that fireworks that explode, move, or emit sparks larger than 12 feet are illegal in the District of Columbia. So if it does, if it does any of those things, don't do it. And as for some other things that go boom, D.C.'s interim police chief has a special message on what not to do. For some reason, People like to shoot guns on the 4th of July and also on New Year's Eve. And it just boggles my mind because what goes up must come down. That's a message that should resonate year round, but with more people out, and especially children, it's particularly important. Revelers won't be the only ones out. Safety go teams will be out as well. Violence intervention specialists across agency, lots of community partners. Teams of 8 to 10 people will be posted at some of the city's hot spots in our nightlife areas in, um, we have a couple in Ward 4 and Good Hope Road. They're not uniform, but they'll coordinate with police and other agencies. They've used them before. They're similar to public safety task forces. It's all about presence. One of the things that we have seen, um, particularly last year on the 4th, is that when we had the teams activated in these hotspot neighborhoods, there were no shooting incidents. Police will be in an all-hands-on-deck stance. The city will also activate its new emergency operations center on Half Street. We can hone and refine our information sharing processes with our federal, state, and local partners. And that's what's happening here for the first time. And they'll deploy this mobile command center. It's like the emergency operations center on wheels. I've seen a one to watch Cooling centers will also be open around the city, especially around city sponsored events like parades and palisades and barracks row. The bottom line, they're pulling out all the stops to make the fourth safe to enjoy. Derek Ward, News 4. Thanks, Derek. And with youth crime on the rise in the district, a business owner in Northeast is offering up a safe space for kids and teens this summer. That's right. A place where they can feel welcome while also learning some practical skills to improve their lives. News 4's Mauricio Casillas shows us how this mentorship program is providing positive paths for D.C. teens. Paul Weinstock is paving the way for the next generation, using his life lessons to teach others. He spent more than two decades in prison, but now owns several businesses, like his and hers restaurant. And if you walk in there this summer, you'll see a bunch of teens looking to learn the ropes. My whole focus and my goal is to be able to give opportunities to other people because I was able to get that second chance. Weinstock's nonprofit, Saving Our Next Generation, focuses on mentoring D.C. youth while teaching them important skills. They're one of several partners helping out with D.C.'s Summer Youth Employment Program. And our program provides safe spaces for young folks to congregate um, and to learn about professional fields that they may not have known about before. As D.C. grapples with teen gun violence, programs like these are more important now than ever because it gives them something positive to do throughout the summer. It may only be for the summer, but it provides you opportunity. You're surrounded by people that say, we're going to start a business, we're going to help you find your talent, we're going to do things like that. Whether it's sharpening your kitchen skills or learning something totally new like embroidery, teens are able to have fun while interacting with positive role models. You're a natural, but you have to keep practicing, but you're a natural. It's good in the world. Why only show the bad? It's not only bad happening in the world. There's many things, good things out here. And the hope is these teens will someday share their skills with the next generation, continuing to highlight the good in their community. In Northeast, Mauricio Casillas, News 4. More than 14,000 teens are enrolled in D.C.'s Summer Youth Employment Program across all eight wards. Making a difference mm -hmm. in the process. All right, here's what's still ahead in the rundown. I'm Julie Carey at Winchester Medical Center, where the longest serving employee here is retiring after 55 years of nursing. I'll tell you what inspired her to become a nurse at age nine and what kept her going even after COVID nearly killed her. An ongoing sriracha shortage. Yes, sriracha shortage. 
It could make things harder for you to spice up your barbecue this summer. The maker of the spicy condiment says that extreme drought conditions have affected the quality and the amount of chili peppers that they were able to produce since last summer. And that has led now to astronomically high prices for the product. One eBay user is selling a 28-ounce bottle for $69. And on Amazon, a two-pack of 17-ounce Sriracha bottles is selling for $123. <laughs> According to the LA Times, Sriracha fans have even been just walking off with bottles out of restaurants. That's approaching hand sanitizer numbers. Yeah, more so. Yeah. Because you know what a bottle that, that size normally costs? Hmm. Five bucks. Wow. From five bucks to 69. And somebody's getting away with something. That's there. a supply and demand situation for sure. There you go. My goodness. All right. This is a lot easier to take. Mm -hmm. uh, a bittersweet day for hundreds of doctors, nurses, and patients at Winchester Medical Center. Today, an angel in scrubs. Barbara McWinney is retiring after 55 years of nursing. Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Julie Carey spoke to us about how today in her professional life and her loved ones, they all returned to her and they showed her so much support even after a bout with COVID almost killed her. So I started out with white shoes, white hose, white dress and a cap. Barbara McWinney's long nursing career with Valley Health started in 1967, but she knew she wanted to become a nurse at age nine when her mom was stricken with tuberculosis and she had to give daily shots. I gave it to her, vomited, and said I want to be a nurse. In her five decade plus career, she's worked across many hospital departments, but always in something involved with surgery. Are you okay? She has known and treated some patients for decades. We love her a bunch. I'm sure they're gonna miss her here, as will I. The doctors say they learned from her. She's forgotten more stuff than I've learned in all my years of training as a doctor. One of Barbara's most memorable experiences, back in the days of strict visiting hours, she helped a young father sneak his baby daughter in to see her mother, who was dying of cancer. Fast forward, she ran into that little girl, now grown in the hospital. She'd become a nurse. And she said, I became a nurse because of you. And I remember my mom because of all the pictures we took. So that was probably one of the very special days for me. Barbara's long career spanning some of medicine's greatest challenges. First polio, the AIDS epidemic, and then the pandemic. Barbara fell ill, very ill, in September of 2020 before vaccinations were available. I kept a calendar and I wrote there one day, dear God, please let me die, I'm ready. Because I just, it was just horrible. Barbara says she never thought twice about returning to work once she recovered. I love nursing. The nurses that I work with, my God, they were overwhelmed and I didn't want them to fight by themselves. I brought you a present. Now those nurses, doctors and hospital staff coming to say goodbye, to give hugs, share tears and laughter. I've known her since she was in utero. <laughs> and if you haven't done the math yet, Barbara is nearly 82 years old. She says it's finally time to travel, to take care of herself for a while. I've cried all day. I've cried. It's kind of happy tears, but um, I have such great support here. I mean, it's just a wonderful place to work. But Barbara's not quite finished caring for others. In her retirement, she plans to volunteer as a hospice nurse. In Winchester, Virginia, I'm Julie Carey, News 4. Thanks, Julie. And Barbara's awards over the years are too numerous to even begin to mention. But they include one of America's best nurses, according to the American Nurses Association. How cool is that? Sounds like she deserved it. Absolutely. <laughs> easily. Absolutely. She's the kind of person you want to write a book. Yes. You want to hear what and learn from her. You and know? you want by your bedside, too. It's been, a, it's been a lot of news this week. I love that we ended with Barbara, the angel in scrubs. I heard that. Mm -hmm. All right, folks. That's going to do it for the News 4 Rundown. Thanks for joining us. I'm Leon Harris. And I'm Tommy McFly. We will see you back here on Monday. Stay safe.
Welcome to Capital Central, sponsored by FH Fur. Here's your host, Sherry Wimple. Today we are here with FH First expert Ethan. Ethan, can you share what trainings and certifications FH for HVAC technicians have to complete in order to become certified? Yeah, our employees go through continuous training uh, to bring our customers absolutely the best service. So during their initial training, employees are given all the tools that they'll need to perform to the standard of FH First customer service. So in addition, uh, they receive continuous class training, uh, hands-on training, and technology training so that they're always up to date with the latest techniques and equipment. Our in-home expert, Sean, is here to tell you some DIY tips on how to make your home more energy efficient. Hi there, Sean here with another handy household tip presented by FH Fur. Here are four ways to make your home more energy efficient. Tip one, unplug your chargers and devices when not in use. Not only does it save energy, but it's also better for your electronics. Tip two, upgrade your windows. A lot of air that enters your home comes through and around windows. If you own your home, consider replacing your windows with low emittance models. Tip three, upgrade your appliances. New refrigerators use four times less energy than old ones. The same can be said for your HVAC systems as well. Higher efficiency means lower bills and improved function. Tip four, landscaping. A well-placed tree to block the afternoon sunlight works wonders to keep the heat down in the summer. Thanks for watching Capital Central, sponsored by FH Fur. The News 4 Rundown is sponsored by FH Fur.